We have Australian cricketing luminary, white ball royalty, destroyer of attacks um, in Legends Leagues. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but beyond that, uh, a polymath with us, uh, an entrepreneur with the T20 Stars company, coach at Delhi Capitals, at least last year. Don't know the status of that. And uh, most recently author of a new book, Winning the Inner Battle, uh, which we'll talk about later in this chat, uh, from Humble Beginnings, where he brushed us uh, nine times to come onto the show. <laughs> to <now>. nine. <laughs> she thought it was more than that. <laughs> <laughs> it probably felt like it. <laughs> to being uh, one of the great friends of the show, uh, our first guest in our new studio, uh, Shane Watson. Watto, welcome. What a privilege to be here. Mm. What a place you've got. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for your support. Um, well, let's hop right into it. Uh, a bit of talk about whether Australia might need a new opener. Uh, do you think you could have managed a boundary in the power play against Sri Lanka on Tuesday night? <laughs> I didn't know you were going to get that hurt. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> Hard hitting. Goodness, yeah. At, there has been for a while. Um, unfortunately, watching Aaron Finch bat, it's it's not that pleasing to watch and hasn't been for a well, while. Well, he says that himself. Which is yeah. just – which is – which is sad to a point because he has been so dominant. He was so dominant for so long. Just how simple he kept the game. He just stood there, took down the best bowls in the world and did it consistently. Um, you know, I was at the other end when he got his 170 against England mm. um, at the Rose Bowl, at the GS Bowl. Um, and so I've seen his, like, his absolute best, but over the last 18 months, it certainly hasn't been so far away from that. And then, you know, the culmination of that innings against Sri Lanka, and I know you know he he came out and said it as well that it wasn't wasn't great. It wasn't unfortunately, mm. unfortunately. So yeah, he more so the selectors and the coach have have committed to him being the captain and opening. So they've got to stay committed to that until the end of this World Cup. And I just more than more than anything, I just hope that he can get out of his own way and not care about his technique. I've been I've been there. Plenty of times when you're just focusing on your technique and focusing focusing about one ball that might get you out, and just have the freedom just to just take the game on. Um, he needs to, yeah, he he needs to be able to step up because it is. You can see it's from afar. It looks like you can see Dave Warner just there's that extra burden of him to be able to really get the innings going as well. Cause not every time is Dave going to get a weight or an absolute fly. And I've been fortunate enough to bat with him as well. Sometimes it takes him a few balls to get going. Sometimes he gets away to a fly, but if he know he knows that that pressure's lumped on him to be able to get the innings going just about no matter what because Finch is struggling and continues to struggle, then that's just going to suffocate him a little, potentially suffocate him a little bit more as well. So it's a little bit of a lose-lose, unfortunately. We, we should date this interview in case you're listening after Aaron Finch has made 100 yeah. against <laughs> One of Fingers the all-time great so. we, are re- so. we are recording on Thursday, the day before Australia plays England at the MCG. It's a bit wet outside, but uh, that, that, that's the context of us going away. Yeah. Um, we, we're talking about like the, the mental challenges of the game, and like I feel like this is quite relevant to Finch as well, though I think um, that also could just be an eye issue for Aaron. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know... Like, I feel like this team is is they they had that success in the UAE last year, right? And they they sort of might have gone a bit more backs against the wall, us against the world kind of mentality. And it strikes me as so different when you're at home and there's expectation if you're an Australian cricket team to win every game you play, obviously. But you're at home and you're a World Cup, you have to win the World Cup. That's anything less than that is failure. Yeah. And like it just strikes me as a little bit like this team might be like wrestling with that, you know. And, and you 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 won the World Cup in 2015, like. Um, was it was it extraordinarily different that World Cup because you were at home? Oh, there's definitely more expectation and pressure on to to win in your home conditions. Um, there, there's no there's no question, especially and and for the um, the Aussie T Twenty team from winning in the in the UAE and playing so well and finally been able to get our T Twenty cricket together, yeah. which took a long time for it to finally click, um, which it did in the last T Twenty World Cup. Then the expectation that it's a just about the same squad again. Yeah. Um, back in our in well in Australia conditions, which we should be really successful in. That just absolutely adds that extra bit of pressure and continues to sort of compound going into that first game. Mm. And you could see in that first game against New Zealand with Finn Allen that first over, that just all that expectation and extra pressure that was put, is on the Australians to dominate and win the, this T Twenty World Cup at home. That one over, you could see that energy just like well, the energy evaporate nearly. Mm. Mm. And that that pressure just like um, really came on even stronger um, from because New Zealand just 
put the hammer down from from really well the second ball. Yeah. So um, that extra pressure certainly is going to they're going to have to we'll really choose the mindset that they that they need. Is it well? You know what we just. We can't think about that. We can't think about the pressure and just, you know what, just take the game on. Mm. Just take it on. Fearless, fearless cricket, which we saw from Marcus Stoinis, that fearless cricket, just to take the game on no matter what. And that's always when everyone's at their best. And I just, they'll discover that. Their back's against the wall. They've got, they've got nothing to really, what well, they've got nothing to lose to a point that this, uh, the English game, they have to be at their best. They have to win. Mm. So they have to find that back to the wall um, fearless mindset to be able to just take the game on. They give themselves a better chance to win. Mm. Do you, just in terms of a tangible thing with the pressure, like it, it, it surely is the media, but is it also like all your friends want tickets to the game and your parents are watching, maybe they're coming to the game, the games are on at Australian time, so the public is Usually. watching social media element as well. Is, is it those things or is it just, is, or is it just the media that the media, the media want you to win so it's, it's front page headlines and news stories and, and that sort of thing? It's all of it combined. It's the it is the it is the media pressure. It's the public expectation as well, which you always can sense when you can sense when you're traveling around Australia um, at the airports or um, right, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can sense it. People talking yeah. to you about it, mm-hmm. how important it is, yeah, how right. good it is that there's World Cup at home. So just those outside um, influences always just comp- they continue to compound it. Mm. The tickets, um, you know, sorting out the logistics around your families yeah. and all that sort of stuff. It just, it adds to it. Whereas the, you know, the last T20 World Cup in the UAE, it was yeah. in a, it was in a bubble. Yeah. It was very, it was very much closed off. So you didn't have any of those sort of distractions. Also being away overseas, you didn't sense the, the public sort of expectation, the media's expectations. Mm. But when you're at home, no matter what, no matter how much you're trying to avoid it, it just com- compounds and that's where you've got to be very diligent around um, what you're taking in mm. to hopefully not <clears throat> not get in your way of um, your best performances, which you need, you need to turn up every, every game, especially those – well, every game is really important, mm. um, but especially the really big games when you know if you, if you lose that then um, against New Zealand or England, for example, there's a chance you might be out. Hey, you've got a you've got a book out, and the way we want to do this chat is that look, we want to make it. Uh, I've got to use a bigger word like contemporaneous to what's happening in cricket now. So you've got so many mm. stories in there, and a lot of advice around uh, the subject matter, which we'll get into. But we're going to make it relevant to the World Cup yep. as well. Um, it occurs to me, like when you talk about T Twenty cricket, when everyone else talks about T Twenty cricket, it does seem to like um, gravitate towards. Words like, you know, fearless cricket or playing mm. free, all these kind of uh, like mental ideas. It's very mm. rarely a technical kind of game, it, it seems. It seems people are getting better at talking about mentality behind cricket. But it occurs to me that while everyone recognises that cricket is a, a game played between the years and a mental game, there's no advice or practical applications available out there. You know, if I read Bradman's The Art of Cricket, which I do every day, <laughs> um, I know how to play straight drive. Yeah. But I I don't know where I can access any information about how to improve myself mentally when it comes to cricket playing in our hallway here with Higos. Uh, <laughs> Just set him up a couple of ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. You know, you've given it away. But um, <laughs> your, your book's called Winning the Inner Battle. It seems to me to be the first book from a like a profile high profile cricketer about mentality in cricket. You know, why did you want to do this book? Well, because of that, the reasons that you're that you're saying um, now, um, that's like it's something that I always was trying to chase and understand. But there was just not not the information out there for me to be able to take in and then and then work on. Um, that was cricketers are always um, like talking about their technique. You've got coaches around who know how to work on your technique. So so that's something that I was always very much a, dri- a technical driven cricketer because that was the information that was coming to me. But um, there was never the information out there of, okay, well, you need to work on your, me- your mental process as well and the mental skills around how you can access all the skills, the technical skills that you work so hard on. Um, and I, I wish I knew like – had access to this information as a 15 or 16 year old because for me personally I just wanted to be I wanted to be the best cricketer that I possibly could be so whether it's physically whether it's technically or mentally I ought to, I was scouring the ends of the earth to be able to find the information that could help me get to be the best as good as I possibly could be and the mental skill side of thing it just wasn't out there unless like I was in the pathways at Queensland even in the Australian team the sports psychologists around but they weren't sitting down and like working through exactly how your mind works, giving you giving me the really simple information. So then I knew 
what to work through at training in games and then how to then decipher it in between games as well so I could continue to work on that skill. So that's the reason why that this book, um, Winning Winning the Inner Battle, I've, I've put together because one, I was so fortunate to be able to work with a guy in the US who taught me this information in, 20, in 2015. So then I was able to apply this information and work through it and work through how it did work, how it didn't work, um, and put that into play for the next four years of more so playing T20 cricket around the world. Um, so I've just got all that... <clears throat> incredible information that he gave to me, which so much of it was so profound. It was so simple for me to understand. Um, Dr. Jacques Delay, he knew, he knew nothing about cricket at all. Mm. So he wasn't talking to me from a cricket perspective. Just He was just giving me the information for me to then put that into cricketing terms, for me to be able to understand how I had to redirect my mind, the control that I had over my mind. Um, and that's where this book's come about. It's just putting the information and working through what then I'd learnt by applying this information um, to put it into a book. So then everyone who wants to learn and understand the mental skills side of the game of cricket, that information is there for them to be able to work on because it's just, it's not. The sports psychologists, the mental skills coaches who are out there in the world, they haven't put it into a book. They haven't put it into a format where you can actually go and, and source it and learn. And that's, you know, that's why this book's um, been put together. But, but isn't it just the case that if you want to be better, you just have to work hard? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's so good. That's so good. I mean, that's what, that's what I was taught. <laughs> you just, you you just got to want it more. You just got to yeah, want it more and right. work hard. If you, if you want it more, then, yeah, you're going to be uh, good. Um, <laughs> but, and that's the thing. You just, like anything, you've got to, you've got, you got, to, got to be good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to work hard. There's, there's yeah. no question. Anything you want to be good at. But you've got to have the right um, instructions and the right information. Yeah. To be able to then work hard on. Yeah. If you've got the wrong information and you're working hard on that, then you're going to be going like backwards or nowhere. There, there's a lot of people who be listening to this show, and this is more of an Australian cultural thing, who might be like, oh, I don't want to get into the nerd mental side of things, but deep down we'll know that it's kind of exactly what they need for their cricket. Mm. Um, I think that a lot of viewers and listeners will find it extraordinary to learn or to, to read your admission that you hadn't sorted out the mental side of your game until after you retired from test cricket. Yeah. Is that a fair comment? Right. And yep. like, there's a quote in the book uh, up the top where you, you said, I wish I knew how negative mind chatter was controlling me rather than taking, uh, rather than me taking control of that little voice and redirecting the script. Like perhaps to um, people will look at you and go, Watto, like you, you did leave no stone unturned. You, you bowled one forties early in your career. You opened the batting. You filled first slip. You captain your country. You play all three formats. You, you mastered more skills than anyone else could really master in cricket, and yet you still needed to work on the mental side of things. Like to connect with those who are listening. What are some of the what's some of the negative mind chatter that would go on in the voice of Shane Watson while you were a fully fledged Test player batting three and you know bowling twenty overs. Oh, the negative mind chatter normally was around if I'd missed out in a couple of games. Um, if I hadn't scored runs or wasn't performing that well, then that, that negative mind chatter, that voice, that little bird, um, birdie that's on everyone's shoulder, that internal dialogue that's going on, would be, well, you need to score runs today. If you don't score runs, you might be, like as an opener in Test cricket. if I don't score runs today, one, I might be moved down the order or I might get dropped. And then that little bird go, well, if you get dropped, well, what's that going to mean? What? what how many get back in? Oh, what am I going to like? Then I'd move to well, what's if my lifestyle going to change? Yeah, like all these different things would start to the little bird mm. in your shoulder. My shoulder would start to ask all those questions. Mm. And the th simple thing about your your mind and your conscious mind is that um, one of the functions of the conscious mind is that little bird on your shoulder, that mind chatter. You are actually in control of that of that conversation. But most of us don't exercise that control that we have and allow that little bird on our shoulder to direct our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Circumstances around us, the environment around us, normally we allow our minds to move in that direction. Instead of grabbing control of that and going, I'm actually in control of what's being said. And you know what? I don't care about like what might happen. Mm -hmm. All I care about is what can I do right now? What do I have to do right now to be able to bring the best version of me to, to this game, to this ball? Uh, and it wasn't until I understood something so simple as that. Mm. And it's like I should have known this information, like that information, just that one little piece of information, but I didn't. Mm. So when I was out in the middle, hadn't scored runs, or I mishit a couple of balls, I'd be like, oh my God, what am I going to do? 
how am I going to get through this? Is this guy going to get me out? When I was getting out LB quite a bit, be like, oh my God, this guy, I'm only looking for that one ball. He's going to get me out again. Instead of just being in control, redirecting it to the right thought at the right time to give myself the best chance of my skills coming out, mm. my technical skills coming out. But again, something so simple that you're actually in control of your of that little bird on your shoulder, I didn't understand it. So that 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 negative mind chatter was controlling me, not me actually redirecting it and making the most of the control that you have. So it was even like it was even mid innings because that's like that's something I can relate to because I was such <laughs> a like like one bad thing went wrong in the game, you know, just to compare our skill levels for a, yeah. for a second. Finally, someone's going to do it. But actually, it. this is the point of the book, right? I've like, seen you actually I've seen you next as well. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't you remember You know that. exactly what's going on. Yeah. I, think it was a stick, I think it was a stick issue, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah, well, it wasn't a stick. Yeah. It definitely, definitely wasn't the kit. You know, like you just play and miss or you just squirt one to cover and just be like, oh, fuck's sake, Ian, like your dad mm. will never love you, your girlfriend's cheating on you, you're going to get fired from your job. You know, all yeah. these thoughts in your head. But yeah. it's <laughs> these are all like, they seem to be magnified in the professional yeah. realm because talking about your lifestyle changing. You know, mm. for me, I would just go and only drink eight drinks that night. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, 18. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, But, you know, having that internal dialogue during the game, like that, wrestling with that must have yeah. been so distracting because you also like get caught in the mire of like is my front foot going across too far mm. like you know it's my back lift coming through okay like but you're also just thinking about all these other things about what it's going to mean for my life mm. that's that's unbelievable <laughs> i mean yeah they, well that, those are the challenges that um professional cricketers work through mm. um and it, well not work through they're trying to digest but again there's no there's no information out there around how to like what the right thoughts are yeah, for you yeah. at the right time to be able to give yourself the best chance of performing at your best. Mm. Um, and and I like I didn't know that I didn't know that information. And and what you said there around when things weren't going well, then everything else in your life's magnified mm. in a big way. Mm. So that's circumstantial confidence. So when things were going great, where I had certainly had periods where I was able to because the circumstance around me pushed me and made me fall into the right mindset. Mm. And I had that for. Well, a number of times, well, a lot of times throughout my career, even before I knew this information, but there was a period of time through like 2009 to 2011 where I, I was at my at my peak and doing stuff that I never thought I could do. Mm. Um, and my my confidence was flying high. Everything around me was, if anything, sort of slightly didn't go wrong, uh, went wrong. I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, I got. I'm I'm going great. Yeah. Whereas other times in my career when things weren't going well, then when things like in my life didn't like something happened it would magnify it even more and you'd feel mm. even worse oh if this happens oh well what i'm going to do now i'm not going to i suck mm. i'm not going to be able to you know i'm not going to be able to come through this so again that's just understanding that and confidence in everything is all, always based around results mm. and that's the one thing that um is is through this through this book the thread through this book really is around understanding how you get the best results that you possibly can mm. and the the way to be able to get the best results that you can is making the most of what you are in control of mm. technically, mentally, your thought processes and just doing that over and over again. And then the results will look after themselves. They'll be what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the main thread is around taking the emphasis off the results because confidence is all based, normally is always based around results. If if my results have been excellent, then my confidence is high. Mm -hmm. If my results have been junk, then normally my confidence is really low. But we all know that for us to be at our best in anything that we do in life, we need to be confident. But we're always basing us, our confidence around results. So we need to base our confidence around bringing the best version of what I can right now, whether mm. it's with our preparation, that's within the control of our mindset and in control of what our skills are, what we need to bring at that moment in time. Mm. And that shift for me was a huge weight lifted off my shoulders because I just always believed if I worked hard enough, then I should that should guarantee mm. me results mm. every time I went out to play. Yeah. I, I don't want to get like uh, two X's and O's on it or, or give away too much in the book. But <laughs> when you read, um, like sometimes if, pe if people read like a self-help guide or, so or something that's kind of promising an improvement in any area of life, once again, the ICC are here to get us. Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> every day. Every day. Uh, every day. <laughs> just letting us know. <laughs> um, just keep you in check. Uh, there's more. Um, I get uh, sceptical when the like – when the sort of the premise of the the promise of a book is that if you do this, you know, if you do X, you will get Y. And what I really liked about your book is that you actually detail the idea that like, because people will listen to this and go, well, hang on, if I do that, what if someone else was doing that too and they have a good day? Mm. 
You know, like you can't always succeed in cricket. No. In fact, you go into the stats around that. Mm. Ponting, uh, etc. only succeeded. He only made 50, 30% of the time. Yep. He batted and he's one yep. of the all-time greats. Yep. Uh, Bradman probably only a little bit better than that. But you actually deal with the idea that like you can – Put yourself into a position of being as confident as possible. There are things you can control, but then you also deal with the things you can't control, like other people having a good day, yep. which I think is um, – it's like a revolutionary mm. idea in cricket, because <laughs> which makes so much sense when you say it. But sometimes mm. other people are going to have a good day, which is probably why we see so many T20 players – walk off the ground now and not look like they want it enough because they kind of understand <laughs> yeah. that yeah, it's not always going to work out for you, right? Like yeah. how do you how do you grapple with that when you're promising, I'm going to improve your mentality, probably results, but yeah, some days it's not going to go so well for you? Yeah, well, that's the – like in the book, that's the performance equation. And that for yeah. me was something that um, Jacques taught to me and it was so profound because um, up until that point, I never – deeply thought about well if someone has a really if someone's just better than me on this day in these conditions then you know what the results are a good chance of not being very good i need to work on this i need to work on this skill to try and be better so there's less chance of that person being better than me on the day but mm. you've got to accept you that accept, you, you've you got actually to do a thing like you do an analysis yeah, of the other person that's right? right it's not just about you yeah, yeah exactly and it could be just a ball that someone bowls you on that day is just like is too good no matter you've brought the right mindset you've brought the best version of you to that like that ball but someone's just bowled a miracle ball or taken an amazing catch or you get a bad umpiring decision that you that you can't control mm. um and then that will have a, a significant impact on the on the results but that's where just understanding that because you aren't in control of that for me once i understood that oh the weight just like lifted off my shoulders mm. it's not using those those things out of your control as excuses though because I, I, I I'm not someone to make excuses. More so, okay, if that happened today, and that person was better than me, or that B that B factor got in the way, a bad umpiring decision. Well, what can I do next time to reduce the chances of that having a significant impact on the result? So it's certainly not using it as an excuse, but it's just taking the pressure off. And for me, once I understood that performance equation, the pressure that stress and worry and anxiety around performance, it just about vanished because I put it into perspective around, well, I've just got to bring the best version of me and ticking all these boxes mm. I possibly can. And then the results will, will look at whatever they are, they are. And then again, after the game, you critique it and work out, okay, well, this happened. So I've got to work on this to try and limit that mm. uncontrollable to having a, a huge impact. So I think that's one of the, um, one of the the deeper like uh, it's not promises of the book like that one of the deeper things that people can get out of it or benefits like when when it's not just about oh how do I how can I score fifty or a hundred more or take five for or four for or whatever it is or bumper bloke and sort of uh, but um <laughs> you really sh you know scare the shit out of him and stuff I mean you talk about that in the book but um but actually if you are uh, if you can manage your stress and anxiety around cricket many people might just actually enjoy the game more yeah. and play yeah, you know yeah. just enjoy playing cricket more which is a game that can give rise to anxiety and stress demonstrably more than other sports yeah mm. and that's the and that's the power of this information is there's two sides to it one is you have more a better understanding and you've got to work on it because it's simple information, but it doesn't mean it's easy to implement. It takes time to be able to work through and more so override your habit, your old habits. <laughs> so override your default habits, which I had a lot of those. Um, so your performance it will be more, more consistently better. Um, but the, the other side to it is because you'll understand this information deeper, the stress and anxiety and worry that always comes in cricket because it's an individual sport and it's, it can be very quite fickle at times. Um, the stress, anxiety, and worry will just about disappear because you are, you've got a deeper understanding of how your mind works, how you can get the best results you possibly can, and that's the and that's the beauty of this really simple information. And I, like, mm. it's not just me. Um, it's like going to university, learning this information, and then going. Well, I retrospectively, if I did this, it would have had this. It would have mm. had this impact. I learned this information while mm. still playing. I had four years of being able to implement it and deeply understand and work out how how it was going to work for me. So, and the one thing that really stood out was just the pressure was unloaded. There was stress and worry mm. about it. Yeah, I had to 
get through, work through the default, my default, which was worrying. I was a very good worrier because I was so desperate for results and de- desperate to be as good as I could. But um, the default is just understanding how I can bring the best version of myself and, and then the stress and anxiety and worry just it evaporates. I really wish we had this mentality at my club where basically runs against our club didn't count. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and even if someone scored a hundred, it's like they were lucky, they were shit, you know, we dropped four catches, which was often true to be fair. Mm. I think, I think that the first time I'd ever appreciated, like it's okay if someone else does well was like, was Ben Stokes at Henningley 2019, you know, <laughs> where it's like, I was just, just did really, like, he was just good. too good. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and then the second one was recently, it was just, I think even Barbara Zam said after this game, against India, Pakistan was like, well, it's just Coley, isn't it? Like <laughs> we were winning the whole game and then Coley happened. You know, it's, it's, yeah. there, there's some freedom to that acceptance, you know, where mm. like you, yeah, you, you control the things you can control, but some things are out of your control and that's also okay, I mm. suppose. Mm. It's, a, it's such a new concept. Yeah. Mm. And, and with that, the, the caveat to that though is someone can absolutely have a great day. Love Virat did the other, the other day um, and Ben Stokes. But if you dissected what happened during that time, yeah. you'd look at a few missed runouts with Ben Stokes. Sure. You missed uh, maybe a tactical error or um, or you just didn't execute exactly to the best of your ability yep. um, when Ben Stokes was going hard and just kept smashing it over the fence. Yeah. So you can dissect it. You go, okay, well, next time, yes, that guy had like, a day out. Mm. Vera had a day out. But what could we do next time to be able to try and reduce that chance of that happening? So it's an acceptance, mm. but then it's like, well – dissecting it critiquing it in a way that it's not it's not like criticism where you're beating yourself down and going you guys we were junk yep. we we're just not good enough is working through okay well how can we get do it better next time to reduce the chances of that person having a day out mm. so just, it's, just it's a different under the waist <laughs> that'll help <laughs> just one ball just, just like, bounce them <laughs> so that that's where it's a it's accepting it that that, that that's gonna that can happen yep. on a day but then it's it's not just putting your hands up and going well, right. it was it yeah. was too it was yeah. just too good and yeah. we can't do anything mm. about it right well there are ways you can try and even still might that person still might have a day out mm. no matter what but there are normally little things you can work on to try and reduce that chance of happening mm-hmm. let, let, mm. let's use the example of stokes then to go into a, a different or like an an added dimension to all of this because we're talking about all of this through the prism of the individual uh, on that day at, at Leeds or at, at Headingley, like uh, Australia through Tim Payne and, but a couple of other players, you know, made or didn't make like a number of decisions that were probably the result of pressure, mm. um, whether it's reviews or, um, or, you know, say, um, you know, Nathan Lund, well, that ball actually hit the sprinkler head. The sprinkler head. So sprinkler head on, on the square. Yeah. Out, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, look, this is my, I'm, I'm adding this on top of this, yep. you, you know, in, in retrospect, Th- that that team wasn't a particularly um, harmonious team in terms of the broader team environment. You know, we, we come to learn later, or at least there appeared to be a level of intensity and pressure to that that probably w- was probably influencing the ability of individuals to execute their skills. So yeah. while the book deals with individuals, you also talk about the impact that other players in the team can have on your mentality yeah. or a coach can have on the mentality in the broader yeah. environment. So, so how do you distinguish between those two things how you meant to kind of play freely and mm. and fearlessly and without stress and stuff but deal with the fact that there are probably other people in the team who are like well you should do it like this or yeah. this is how we play this you know just yeah, answer that for yeah, us. yeah yeah well that's <laughs> so one part is education so educating trying to educate as many people as possible to understand what the right team environment is a starting point and what the language should be around the successful team environments. That's, that's one part, which is all around, um, well, being the best version of you and everyone's different. And like, it always, it makes me, it, it makes me sad when I hear stories about people having to rebel against a team environment to be themselves. Have you ever had to do that? Not so much me, but I've, se- I've seen it at, I've seen it quite a bit with other with some other people. They've been reined in to go. No, you shouldn't bat like that. You shouldn't bowl those balls. Um, mm. This is the this is the team plan. Whereas the individuals like, well, my best ball to bowl is under pressure. Is a leg stump Yorker under pressure? Is that no no no? The plans are to bowl wide. So it's understanding well what's the best thing for me to be able to execute my skill under pressure. So that takes courage to be able to rebel against a, a, a team environment or a directive from the team to be able to actually um, bring. Or execute your skill the best of your ability to have mm. set yourself up for as success as much as you can. Um, but the team, the team environment is um, for me 
and I've been around so many different team environments where, um, and once once you know this information as well, then as soon as someone comes in and starts like building up the importance of this game, well, you know what, we have to win today. If you if you don't win, you know, we're going home. Mm. Or select um, spots are up for grabs. If if you don't perform today, you're out. Mm. And get, get as soon as that, as soon as, and I've heard that a number of times mm. in teams oh, I've you played talk in. about it in the book. Yeah. The, yeah. Everyone starts thinking about, oh, geez, I better score runs or do enough mm. to be able to get another game. Mm. Whereas the successful team environments are around how can we individually work through allowing you to be the best that you possibly can be. Mm. Um, and and once that once that team environment's created and once people are, understand it enough that that's the language, and I've been fortunate enough to be around environments where that just innately happens anyway, even without people fully understanding the power of it, um, then that's when the, the most successful teams that I've been a part of, that's exactly what mm. happens. Um, but again, it's people have got to understand the information enough to be able to then not get in the way of other people, not say something that might derail someone's performance because they've said something like, well, if you don't score runs today, then you're definitely not playing the next game. So there's an example in the book just to like paint a picture for people. Um, so you're not giving any, like, you know, this isn't uh, shitting on anyone. You've literally written it in public and everyone's going to see it now. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're, playing, you're playing in the IPL for RCB. and That was Rajasthan at that time. Oh, pardon me. Sorry. Yep. Is this, this, so I've got one here where you, you wanted to take you wanted to take a guy down. Oh, sorry, my yeah, bad. You're yeah. right. Well, I was, was going to defer to you. I mean, you no, are no, the person. You know. yep. <laughs> um, and you want to take a guy down. And uh, and you talk earlier in the book about, you know, when you're feeling like the matchup is right for you and you've got to do it. Yep. And then other times the same bowler might bowl, but they're just playing better and you you understand that and you rein it in. But on this occasion, you wanted to take a guy down, you decide you're going to do it, but then someone of the stature of A.B. de Villiers <laughs> comes up to you in the middle of the over, all well-intentioned probably, and says, no, I think you should put that away. Let, let's take this deeper. So can you tell us about that situation? Yeah, oh, right? and and totally well-intentioned. A.B. de Villiers is just one of the greatest people you'll ever mm. meet. He's just such a kind, caring it just seems like it's not real because he's mm. such a good guy. Yeah. But um, – so, so, <laughs> yeah. right, so I have to start – I have to start no, no. We're also, every, We love you, AB. You're the fucking greatest. Yeah. <laughs> and everything was well, is well-intentioned. But And this was just an example for me through at, – at that time where I understood this information as well around gut feel, trusting my gut, that if this was the matchup and I knew this was, this was the right time, then I just had to fully commit to that. But then having AB at the other end – and he's and in between, it was in between overs. It's like, and I was like, I saw the bowler. I'm like, okay, I can definitely. This is my guy. That You're I can not going to say the down. bowler is though. No, I can't remember who the bowler was, but oh, it was. It, but it was in the time. <laughs> it was like, okay, this is my guy. I'm going to take down. Is and AB just said something, and it was again well intentioned. Mm. I think maybe we should just take the game just that little bit deeper. So then I was walking back to to face up to that bowler. I um, mean, he started running. I'm like. I feel like it's a right. He, he's the right matchup to take down, but maybe just said to take a bit deeper. Should I? Shouldn't I? And then before I knew it, I'd half committed, half committed to the shot, and I hit it straight up, and I was out. Mm. I remember, and I walked off. I just thought I've just got to trust what I feel, and it's not. And and then I see like coaching as well with the Delhi Capitals. That's one thing that really stood out to me as well is around different people getting in the way of what people like of their gut, of someone's gut feel. So a bowler going, this is my best ball right now to get myself out of trouble and having someone else within the team going, oh, no, I think that's this is the right ball to bowl, not this one. Mm. And you just start questioning what mm. you believe is the right right thing to do at that moment in time. Um, and that just comes around setting things up. So, if, again, if I had my time again with AB, I would have listened, I would have heard that and gone and just put not say, not say it to him, but just in my own mind go, okay, that's what he would do. But what's right for me right now? Because this is what I feel is the right thing to do. This is my matchup that mm. I've really got to try and capitalize on. Mm. And again, that's just around the mental strength of the discipline, just to shut it out and go. No, this mm. is what I need to focus on right now. And again, it just takes one. It takes discipline, like mental discipline, to go. Okay, no, I've just got a single. That's what I feel, and then I've just got to fully commit to it and not allow anything else to come in whatsoever. And that's, and that's the simple definition of mental toughness as mm. well. And it's, I just thought that was mental toughness was always just about, well, for the select few. Yeah. For the select f- few who were just, they were tough and they were always like that. Mm. But what it really is, is just understanding how to be able to shut the noise out and just commit to what's coming down. Trust what you feel and then fully committing to it and not allowing anything inside your bubble to penetrate. Yeah. And 
it is available to everyone. Yeah. You just got to understand how to be able to let that informa- let that outside influence bounce off to be able to just bring the best version of you to your ability to execute. So just 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 to follow up to that. So you <laughs> uh, I'm sorry I'm like I'm really getting into this. Uh, but um <laughs> So this would be instructive for coaches and captains and leaders too, in the sense that, and you you talk about this, you know, you're you're more convinced that teams should permit players to manage their own mental and physical preparation, yeah. you know, rather than kind of overlay a uh, instructions like you're some oh, these are my words, but some kind of director with a with a cast that you're mm-hmm. choreographing. So is that have you experienced that in the IPL? Like, it, did, are there certain captains or coaches who are more that way inclined, where they're like, "Well, I've got the team in here. Maybe we'll overlay some cultural or values principles." But really, it's about the job of the captain and the coach is to understand how each player plays their best and and kind of uh, uh, alchemize that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, that's. I was, uh, yeah, I've been very fortunate to experience that in in a number of different teams. That that environment where there was like just a, a set sort of structure of play, but then it was okay. Let's just get out of people's way. Um, and the environment that stood out to me because it was just how it was always always had been was at um, Chennai Super Kings mm-hmm. with uh, with Stephen Fleming and MS Dhoni. That's just something that they that's their that's their skill set. Whether they innately did it just by instinct to start with. But then they realised the power of it was one never putting people under pressure through selection. Uh, also, always just trusting what they felt from a um, when they were picking the squads to start with, and then picking the team to start the tournament, and then just committing to it and knowing the impact they can have if you chop and change teams because people just start playing for themselves and just do enough to get through. Um, but then in the team environment and the conversations is all around. Okay, how can we? How can we just? like perform at our best today mm. and just bring the best version of us mm. and not not talk about we need to win today or if we lose we're all those different stuff how important results are they just took they just took all that pressure out of that environment and that was why it was such the people who go and play at the Chennai Super Kings have always really enjoyed their time mm. because there's no extra pressure coming down from we need to win you need to play like this stop playing that shot there's there's nothing like that so um, that for me was the realization that well, I didn't have to like think in my own mind while they're saying that, so I have to do this. It was what they said was exactly what my mindset was anyway, and that came through in my first year of playing with Chen- the Chennai Super Kings, but also in the second year where I went like seven or eight games with only getting like one forty, uh, um, a forty runs in the second game, and they stuck with me, feel knowing that well, believing that I was going to come good at the back end of the tournament, and also they didn't want to um, drop me. And potentially, then the person coming in was under pressure. But also, other people around the team, in, around the team, would go. Well, if they dropped him, then well, gosh, if I miss out in a couple of games, then I could be done as well. Mm. So, if everyone just the fear of failure starts to really come up, and we all know that when we're at our best, we don't think about the result, the well, not the results, the outcome, and whether I might fail. They did the same with uh, Guy Court, didn't they? In the end, who got the he got the orange cap? Is that two years? That yeah. might have been two mm. years ago. Yeah. Now they're stuck mm. with him in getting seven hundred runs or whatever. It was yeah. just, I was just thinking about when you were saying before about having that clarity <clears throat> when you're about to perform a skill, and just reminded me, funnily enough, of I was listening to Owen Morgan speak this morning, um, who I think is now back to being an Irish cricketer, former Irish player, <laughs> um, and um, and he was talking about the 2016 T20 World Cup final bet- um, against the West Indies for England, mm-hmm. and Ben Stokes is bowling the final. Over, I think I think West Indies need seventeen or something, something mm-hmm. to win. And he was just talking about the pressure of playing in a World Cup, and he was saying that he has a regret over that because he wished he slowed everything down, and he wished he had a two way conversation with Ben um, because it's he didn't say it explicit, explicitly, but I think he was saying that I think he just went to Ben Stokes and said, this is the plan, this is what we're going to do, and it ended up failing. And I think that might have been against what Ben Stokes was actually trying to do, which mm-hmm. sounds like very similar to what yep. you were saying with AB de Villiers. And it was yep. just very interesting to – that that's that's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Like if Ben Stokes might, might have felt something it's like this is how I think I'm going to win this game, but the team plan was this, and it didn't work out for them. And obviously, West Indies going to win the game. So it's um, it's it's obviously a, a relatively common occurrence in the professional realm where there are so many backroom staffers who are giving you yeah. data and matchups and all these things. So yeah, it, it's yeah. interesting. No, it's it's absolutely right, and that and these like these situations occur like occur all the time. Yeah, and it, once. And when people just understand it, like understand it a bit more, then there's more chance of being able to get better results. Mm. It's, just, it's it's really it's really as simple as that. Mm. And then and 
I'll, I'll always keep batting uh, b- back to keep coming back to from a bowling perspective. You know, you individually know better than anyone what the right ball is to bowl at that moment in time, more mm. than anyone on the planet, mm. because you're the one since you're a kid who's had to accept the consequences when it hasn't gone well, more than anything. And you've also seen when it has gone well. Mm. So you know better than a coach who's only been with, seen like been around you maybe for six months, or a captain who you might not have worked with before. You know better than anyone what the right ball is to bowl at that moment, moment in time. And if you don't know, that's when you go, excuse me, can you please help me? Yeah. I need help. But the honesty around that, um, once, the, once the leadership around a team understands that the, the, power, the power of the gut feel or trusting what you feel, then, gosh, the ability for these people to execute under pressure and get the better results is just going to – it's going to increase significantly. Yeah, yeah. You, you say in the book that, like, the, <clears throat> the next stage in training is, is not, you know, physical technique but minds. Like, how different are players' mindsets today than that of – yesteryear do you think i'm not even sure where i'm going back in with yesteryear but like even though you can't really see someone's mind (laughs) was there anyone when you look back on that you might have played with or even before that that you think was ahead of their time maybe maybe this kind of maybe mentality came naturally to them or whatever but maybe Mm. ahead of their time um in terms of their psychology because the reason yeah. I say this is, like, I, I remember Ian Chappell saying something similar to, um, not, not quite as uh, advanced or sophisticated as you, around um, controlling thoughts. He used to, he used to say, I, I believe, I'm paraphrasing here, but, like, you know, any time you have a negative thought, counter it with a positive. Mm. And I suppose um, he's not using, like, um, you know, couch psychology language, but yeah. he's at least showing he's aware of his thoughts to start with and yeah. he's consciously trying to usurp them, you know. Yeah. So just trying to think if, if there's anyone you've played with that may have just naturally exhibited a lot of these um, factors. Yeah, so like a couple of – it's a great question. There are a couple of people who stand out to me, like, who just understood – around a, a part of the mindset and what you said about Ian Chappell, I hadn't heard that, but um, he's absolutely right. Whether it's positive or for me, I'd say more the right thing. Yes. Right. It's right. the right thing. If it's a negative thing, the right, the right thought, mm-hmm. um, but the positive things, it normally is a positive mm-hmm. thing. Um, Ian Chapp, uh, sorry, Greg Chapp, I remember talking to, to him and he always talked about like his routine in between balls, um, batting in test matches in particular around just switching off and switching back on. And I didn't really understand that around like your mind, your brain's like I a muscle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that you only got a certain amount of um, mental um, energy every day. Yeah, and if you if you're on all the time, if you're concentrating hard, like even in between balls, then you'll you'll burn your mental energy out, and then you'll you won't be able to execute your skill to the best of your ability. But I didn't I didn't understand that, even though and a lot of cricketers do and did up until um as well um and greg chapel certainly knew that that he just had to switch on and switch off to be able to um because he only had a certain amount of mental energy um every day so that was one one person that was just very that's very mm-hmm. simple around mental energy but the person who really stands out to me who who just comes it was always come across as a scrapper and he always just got like got things done he's tough um and just was able to just yeah it was he came from you know, Mowbray in, in, in Tassie and was just tough and he just – nothing got in his way. It was Ricky Ponting. Mm. And it wasn't until – and this is how, for me, this is a sad thing about my time with Ricky, um, playing with him, and I've known him since I was 19, that I always talked about batting, always talked about technical technical side of things. But I never asked him around, around the mental and w- what worked for him and what he was doing and why he was doing it. And I mentioned in the book a couple of, a couple of things that he did which – which just is brilliant, and he and it worked for him. He discovered that it worked for him. One was around his um, use use of visualization um, the night before he batted. So he would he would he'd write he'd write in a diary. He'd write sort of his points and cues, but then he would visualize what was going to happen the next, the, potentially the next day, who he's facing, and that sort of thing, and then would go to sleep. And he found that was the best way to be able to sort of just tap into the power of imagery and visualization mm. so he did that and the guy from mowbray did that yeah. right mm. um also around as the bowl was running in he just all i could see from the um from the non-strikers end was him just saying watch the ball like a few times as the bowl was running in and i didn't i just thought he's he just wanted to make sure he watched the ball mm. but the reason why i said watch the ball at certain stages of the bowl running in was to not allow any other thoughts to come in yeah you talk about this in the yeah. book right so so he did that because he just knew that if he didn't put th- like that, watch the ball in as the ball started to run in halfway through his run up, and as he was about to get his delivery stride, and then as the ball came out, then 
something else, a premeditation, like a pull shot. Oh, he's going to might bowl this. Just could mm. come in. Mm. So he didn't allow it to come in. I wish I knew that. Mm. And the other thing that he did was, and I mentioned this book in the book as well, was he Ricky Ponting always asked the umpire how many balls left in the over. Every every over that I batted with him throughout two. my career, yeah. how many balls left? It was always two. Yeah. He always knew that it was two, but he needed that just confirmation every over to go, I just need to get through to the end of the over. Yeah, with intent, and he was, didn't mean he was just going to block that, the last two balls, but that was – and he, he discovered that, well, that came about because of his dad going, if you get out in the last couple of balls, the over is weak as piss. Right? <laughs> weak. Yeah. Didn't, didn't, never, didn't his dad never say if you average 40 in shield, you should give it up? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> then, um, so those are the few things that, again, it wasn't until I finished playing mm. and I asked him, um, and that was during my podcast, that I asked him about these questions that – he did things for these specific reasons. And mm. that's one of the reasons why he's so good. Yes, he worked so hard. He's mentally tough. He knew how to l- let things bounce off him. But he had these techniques mm. that are so powerful mm. that other people can use as well for this, with the same power. He must have played with like such a wide variety of guys in, in different mental states when they were batting especially. <laughs> like I'm just thinking about the difference must have been so stark between batting with like a, a Mike Hussey who seems – like just fucking driven for <laughs> cricket, right? And like Warney, who just sort of turned up, you know, rest yeah. in peace for the king. But, you know, it was – did you enjoy batting with like someone super intense or more kind of like laissez-faire? <laughs> <laughs> um, both in cert- – well, I enjoyed batting with certain people in different ways. Like Mike yeah. Hussey was always on. Yeah. And and every time you went – if if I was batting below him, every time I'd walk out to bat, you go, oh, how's, it, how's it going? And he'd be on like 70 off maybe 50 balls, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he'd go to bat and he'd uh, say, how's, how's it going, Eddie? Because you're hitting the ball nice. He goes, oh, Jesus, I, I can't find the middle of the bat. I just feel like he's, <laughs> he's, gonna, he's just going to be beating me on the inside. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> so he was always – but that's the thing that drove him as well yeah. is like looking to make sure that he, um, he was one step ahead and yeah. was just – I suppose that mentality for him – was pushing him to stay focused, like, and he was so yeah, good at at, right. at keeping his concentration for long periods of time. Because I suppose he always just had that that doubt in his mind. So he was like, "No, you know what? I'm not. I'm not in." And that was the thing that kept mm. driving him. To be yeah. fair, um, there's a part in the book where you're like, "Oh, I've had the worst test innings of my life. Four hours for 81 against India." So yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I'm fucking hate that. Watch, you gotta watch <laughs> the highlights of that. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> That's scrappy, scrappy affair. Yeah, yeah. I've had plenty of videos. Yeah. Just, just scrap my way to 81. <laughs> the scrappy, SCG scrappy test India. 80. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, whereas there's other people that I um, batted with. Um, you know, Shame want to bat with a little bit, but the one person I loved batting with that I didn't bat with a hell of a lot was Andrew Simons. Right. Mm. Oh, he's just his presence at the crease yeah. and especially playing spin. Mm. Oh, oh my gosh. Like he I remember I was batting with him in a shield game um, at the Wacker. Uh, Brad Hogg was bowling and I was sort of just waiting for him to bowl a loose ball and he was bowling pretty well for a couple of overs. I was sort of just defending the ball. And Andrew Simons, after at the end of one of the overs, said, If you don't get me on strike, <laughs> I'm going to run you out. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, jeez, okay. Next, then he got on strike, bang. Next one, yeah. next two balls straight into the stands. Yeah. But that was just the presence and freedom that he had. And he just had you know, a pretty carefree, very carefree sort of mindset. Yeah. He trusted his he trusted his skill. Um, and that was the beauty of knowing they had those you know, special times with him. Yeah, so so, yeah. so you, you accessed it like you through, through and in the book you go into mental models. These aren't just uh, like, you know, cliches you're throwing out there. Like mm. it, it, it develops in, and I don't want to give it away, but it develops into a, um, a, a foundation, a methodology, yeah. a mental model. And it's all very easy to um, apply as well across life, like beyond – cricket mm. having kind of applied it in the back end of your career and played some of your best cricket like what is the feeling like to uh i didn't experience a lot myself but like what's <laughs> it what's it like when you are on top of your game mentally like is it what's the feeling is it is it just um is it an endless reserve of of confidence is it the removal of stress and anxiety is it both of those things like did you end up finding a way to play cricket enjoy it succeed and put it all in perspective is that is all we're talking about yeah all of those things <laughs> and once i once i understood um the different things that i needed to work on and then every time i was out in the middle every ball that i faced every ball that i was bowling i was pulling myself into the right um, headspace um and i know it's very it's a sort of very like loosey sort of term the the zone or the flow state but that but everyone's always trying to find that place in whatever you do where it just seems like easy. Mm. 
And it doesn't happen all the time, but that's where you're always trying to chase to find that space in whatever you do, where whether it's just re- you're recalling information, you just want to, or you just know that you're in the space that you can do, you're reacting as a, as a cricketer. Um, and once I understood how to be able to pull those parts together, technically and, and mentally, had the mental skills to be able to pull that together, once you got there, it wasn't just by falling into that space and the like the circumstances or the planets aligned, you fell into that space. It was the control that you had was pulling it, pulling those components together. Um, and knowing that I had that control and it didn't happen all the time, but when those two things aligned, then knowing you had the control to be able to bring that together is something that's, mm. Mm. it's so satisfying because it's not just the circumstances presented themselves that you fell into it. You're actually in control to try and pull that together. Um, and the thing with this book, yes, it's cricket. It, it's cricket specific with the examples, but the, the core of the information is, just, is universal across every aspect of your life. And the whole, it's a progression of thought to the point at the, at, towards the end is around defining the best version of you. And again, that, that can be from a cricket perspective, that can be in any aspect of your life that you want to be as good as you can. Because most of us never define the best version of us. So we don't know what we're chasing every time we're going to perform. I never, I never mm. did. I just, mm. you know, I had a bit of an idea, but I didn't know exactly what it was. Mm. And the and the book helps you to really define that deeply. So then every time you go out to perform, whether it's on the career field, whether it's other mm. parts of your life, you know what you're chasing, you know where you're trying to get to. And the power of that, because you are in control of pushing yourself to get there and pulling yourself to get there, then that's then all the stress and worry and anxiety just it evaporates. Um, so if like, yeah. I don't know, like if you're like a leg spinner and like in the Nance, you're sort of ripping past the first graders and the, you invite to state training, you bowl to them, ripping past them, then in the games, it's just double bounces and full tosses. Like, for example, <laughs> are you saying that like later on, if you haven't played for a while, read the book, maybe maybe finally get the, get the psychological apparatus to sort of, you know, finally go all the way and, and achieve a, a, achieve what you believe your potential was, sort of under 13s to 16s, emerging blues, and then sort of how to fall away sort of thing? It seems quite personal, that question. No, it's just a, it, it's a, it's a time on a <laughs> tail, you know. The leg, <laughs> the leg is good in the nest. Is, for those listening, Pez didn't blink for 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, Age well, 37, well, sort well, of <laughs> see if you can get a bit of time <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. Do a podcast. Four, and, four, yeah. Four-year-old, two-year-old sort of. <laughs> Um, but in the end, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Um, mm. and, and the book default, like every, the information around there defines that around there's a skill set component and there's a mindset component. And what you said there around a leg spinner, my experience was with a, a leg spinner that I played with in, in grade cricket when I was 16. There's a leg spinner that I played with who bowled incredibly well in the nets, like so skillful, wrong flippers, b- turning yeah. leggies big time, hardly ever bowled a bad ball. And then came into the game and would – came into a game and would start to bowl some, like, full tosses and a couple of double bounces and just – and I remember thinking, what the hell's going on? This guy is so good in the nets. And then he'd go back to the nets the next week and still – and bowl like a genius again. And it's all around just understanding that, yes, you've got your skill set that you work so hard to develop, but there's a mindset, a mental environment around those skills sitting. And if your mental environment isn't right, isn't correct – then your ability to be able to access your skills is it just about disappears mm. and you start doing things that you well you can't access all the skill the incredible skill that you've got and the books all around understanding what the right mental environment is for you to be able to access all of those skills mm. and everyone everyone's most mental environments they're, they're fairly similarish but you'll you'll be able to, you'll be able to know how to define the mental environment for you that you need to be able to access all those skills because like I saw it myself in, in training when I had no fear about getting out, I'd play shots that like, I was like, gosh, where, where did that come from? But then I'd sometimes take that into a game and, and have the fear of, oh, what if I get out? What if I don't nail that ball? What's going to happen? Well, oh, my team can't afford me to get out. And then I miss hit a ball that's right in my, in my, in my zone because those doubts, that mental environment's changed. Um, so it's, it's available to everyone. Mm. Mm. Winning the Inner Battle uh, goes on sale 7 November. So this is where we're recording this, 27th October, 7th November. And if you want it, you go to shanewatson.com. 
dot au. au. Yeah. Just go Shane Watson dot au. Yeah, Shane Watson dot au. You know, I'm it's reading, it. I'm reading yep. it, and I'm like, is it a typo? Is it? Is it? No. Is it not? Shane Watson dot au. So that was a test for you, just to see um, <laughs> entrepreneurially if you're on top <laughs> of your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Shane Watson dot au. Uh, to buy a paperback ebook or audio book version. So you're just getting it direct from Watto. It's part of the brand. It's kind of like T20 stars. We're not talking about that right now. But uh, shanewatson.au for winning the inner battle to uh, basically fix your life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> learn how to be confident, etc. cetera. Watto, thanks so much for your time, mate. I know uh, you, we've got Australia, England tomorrow night. You're hovering around. Uh, you're, you're, you're white ball royalty. And it's always a huge honour to, to be in your presence and to uh, hear what you've got Stop. to say. <laughs> it's very kind. Thanks for having me, guys. Always a pleasure.